All right, part number two, my friends, in the two-part cinematic series. That is our discussion with Matt Brooks from Net Daily and from the Clear Out podcast. In this portion, we talked about the superstars in part one. Now, it's about the supporting cast, about the adjustments that Brooklyn can make going into game number three, and ultimately, how much blame should be on the head of one Steve Nash. It's all coming up right after the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast and the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I'm Adam Marbrecht covering the New York football giants on the One Giant podcast. He is Doug Norrie. He's got you covered for all your daily fantasy needs over on DFSR, FanDuel, DraftKings. That's your guy. We go into part number two with Matt Brooks from Nets Daily from the Clear Out podcast, breaking down what has gone wrong for the Brooklyn Nets overall in the first two games of this series and whether or not the adjustments can be made to get back into it in game three. Do you at all prescribe to the idea? Cause Doug and I batted this around briefly where it's like, okay, you're struggling Kevin Durant and you go back to game number one, the offensive sequence, Kyrie kind of roams around, maybe misses some open opportunities to find some other players and then gets it to Kevin Durant. Now he gets it late in the sequence, but just that idea of man, at some point, especially like in game number two, Hey, lean into the guys that are that are doing it for you. You know, Doug mentioned it. You get some, you know, unexpected, otherworldly performances from key contributors like Dragic and Bruce Brown, and even Curry gives you the sixteen. At some point, does Kevin Durant need to go? All right, I, I don't have it right now, but I can still impact this game in a different way. Like you said, defensively first, I can still do that. And if if I was locked in defensively and still gave the performance I gave in game number two, we might actually win that game just by what I can bring on that end of the floor alone. Yeah, uh, for me, like I, the sequences where it was like, all right, we're gonna, like, I, I don't want them to like clear out for Seth Curry because, like, that's <laughs> they did that a couple times and it was a like, all right, far. let's not do that. It's it's really just the simple things where it's like they don't need to be. I mean, a it would be nice if if they did run sets uh, for Seth or or whoever. Uh, I think we're a little late in this juncture. I'm they could probably mix in more like dribble handoff sets for Seth and all that. I. I, you know, I don't know. They are going to play how they're going to play at this point. But it's like even just the like they don't need to like restructure the offense because I, I don't I mean, they I guess they have time. They could do that to a degree. But um, it's just the little things like KD keeping his head up when he dribbles and recognizing, hey, there's a guy sitting on my on my hip here uh, that's helping over. Like, I bet that guy is going to be open here. And if he's not open, he can kick one more to the corner and that'll be an open corner three. So it's like very low hanging fruit in a way that I think the Nets and KD can and need to take advantage of before we even think about, hey, what if we restructured the offense and like brought back Kenny Atkinson sets for Seth Curry? It's like it, look, just the little things. We can start micro, and then we can start going a little more macro. Right. Can't, you can't build the, rebuild the entire house before you at least fix some of the foundation. As we yep. get into then uh, the coaching side of it, adjustments. There's a key player we want to get to here. It's just funny that – when you bring up this box score, one of the areas uh, that the Nets always struggle in is being outshot. They had one more shot attempt in this game than the Boston Celtics. The Celtics only shot 35% from beyond the arc, right? Like, so there's some of these categories they won in game number two and still came out on the losing end. But inside of that, one guy that has now given you two consistent performances, maybe the only guy that's given you two consistent performances, has been Goran Dragic. Um, he doesn't get back in until late in the third quarter. I had said, I understand, you know, maybe he only has so much mileage on the legs, but it was predicated on the fact that by the end of the game, I wouldn't look and see 20 minutes in the box score adjustments. The Steve Nash, who was the key figure in getting Dragic here. Are you surprised? And do they just need to go to him more and make him a bigger part of what they can do offensively? If he can. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I didn't look at Drogic at the very end of that game and feel like, wow, he's got the juice. Cause in that, when he came in in the third and the fourth quarter, I didn't think he was like super effective. I, I'd, I'd have to look at his shot chart. Missed like, his look. last couple of shots in the yeah. first quarter where and that kind of spoke to my point of, but maybe he only has about 19, 20 minutes. I mean, he's like, you know, he's an older point guard, you know, at this point, like you kind of know what you're getting from him at this point. So I saw that point made a lot and I, I agree with it in premise, but I also think we need to remember that Goran Dragic was like a buyout guy. Like there's a reason you can't just 
it's the same thing with the Drummond experience where it's like, you can't ride Drummond for 35 minutes and expect every single pick and roll defense rep to be good or for his hands to be perfect the whole time. Like th these guys are on like the contracts or the situations that they're in for a reason. And they're joining a roster that's pretty, you know, strapped for cash for lack of a better term because of where all the money's gone. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think I, 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 I like the idea of playing Drogic more, but I also recognize like, I think there's a pretty, you know, firm line of where you can, how much you can actually play him and get like effective minutes out of him. And this is where you kind of start running into, and I think this is, uh, I, I, you were, you were metaphorically doing this, I think at the beginning where it's like throwing your hands up because it's like, what are the adjustments? Like there just might not be any, I know no one ever wants to hear that <laughs> because it's just, it's, it's KD play better. Like it's not it's, the feed. It's not the fetus. There's a difference between the fetus and realist, right? There's, there's those. And sometimes though that Venn diagram can overlap in ways that make fans feel really, really uncomfortable because it can blow your brain to not, they're always a fan will always wants to be able to look at something and believe that there's something else that can happen. It's like the core of being a fan. If you did not believe that you would stop watching sports and just go get another hobby. Right. So like people always want to be able to find some kind of solution. Sometimes the solutions are like you said, are just as simple as this other thing, but there aren't probably a lot of other bullets to fire here because this is just what the nets have. Like, you know, they have maybe Simmons is it. I I'll we'll get your opinion on that real quick here, but I, I'm I'm you can hear the pessimism in my voice, I think. But like um <laughs> like, I hate to bury I hate to bury that lead with the with with the way that I framed it. But like well, by the I, way, as, as we said, like you can't, you know, we've avoided talking about Ben Simmons for the sake of if we talked about it, he would have been playing for the last three months. Let's just do it right can, now. But but no, because I no, I'd rather <laughs> oh, spend sorry. time on something more interesting, at least from my standpoint. And fans fans come to me for this; they expect it from me. <laughs> the Brooklyn Nets rewarded Kessler Edwards for his play in the regular season by cutting James Johnson and bringing him into the postseason roster. Now you can look at the four minute sample size and see the two fouls, whatever. Is that is that all that it was? We're rewarding him for for doing what he did in the regular season and being a kid that we like, and he obviously has done everything he can to develop because you cut a guy to whatever his functionality was and however high the peaks were and low the valleys were. James Johnson was playing minutes on this team. You've now gone for a guy who you're not utilizing at all, and whether or not I think he would foul out in seven minutes if you gave it to him, I'm a little surprised, especially in a matchup like this where like size and length could be to your advantage Yet Kessler Edwards, he's gotten two little sniffs and then he's been pulled out and they have not looked back to him again. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I am surprised about the the steps process taken and then the results we're looking at now. I would love to know what this organization thinks of their title chances. Just I just want to know mm. because there are there are just certain moves that are made like that one. I look, I for me, that's smart. Get rid of James Johnson, get Kessler Edwards in for, you know, a, a whatever a, a, I guess controlled contract you have him locked down for a year I think he has a team option in year two so that's smart like get that guy locked in great I just would like to know where where they see themselves going do they see themselves like if they really took a long hard look in the mirror and they said hey we've had this season where a player missed two-thirds of it uh because of you know a personal choice uh we've had to restructure the team because a guy forced out you know, do you guys honestly think you could win a title this year? Or are you also angling just a little bit? And you've lost Joe Harris, by the way, who would be crucial in this series. Um, is there a little bit of you that's saying, you know, we're kind of we're kind of thinking, hey, maybe next year is the year instead of this one. Okay, we're going to get more into the conversation with Matt Brooks. First, got to talk to you about our friends over at True Build. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's easy because those businesses are out to get you. They want those corporations want to pocket your money. They want, you need to download Truebill right now to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't want, you don't need, or you just simply forgot about. On average, wait for this number, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Imagine what you can do with that extra savings. Companies like to make subscriptions hard to cancel. Truebill makes it incredibly simple. You just link your accounts Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. It's like a concierge service for all those subs you don't want. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped to save them over, wait for this number, $100 million. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash 
Locked On NBA. Go right now, truebill.com slash Locked On NBA. You could save you thousands a year. And when you've saved those thousands a year, why don't you go ahead and spend it on something that's good for you? And that's going to be with our friends over at Built Bar. Because as you know, if you're looking to get yourself a dose of protein, you're not looking to put bad products into your body that are just going to drag you down. No, 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 my friends. Built Bar remains that first one-of-a-kind producer of the Puffs, marshmallow-infused protein bars. You got to love that. You know that they're going to be covered in 100% real chocolate, and even the Puffs are also covered in that 100% real chocolate. You'll get those stat lines, as we like to talk about. 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, just 4 grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to 240 calories in a candy bar. 30 grams or more inside of those of sugar. I don't think so, my friends. Delicious flavors. If you can think of one, they've probably already produced it because they have mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and even cookies and cream. You go over to built.com right now. Use promo code LOCKED15. You're going to get 15% off on your order. You use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, we're going to finish up with Matt Brooks here. It's been a great conversation so far. First, we're going to talk to your talk to you about our friends over at betonline.net betonline.net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info it's got the sports developments you need they got league reviews news it's really a one-stop shop for all of your betting needs they're going to take you through the basketball playoffs they got major league baseball action up there really every sport you can imagine go over to europe for some stuff as well bet online has it all your continued source for all of your sport sporting wagering information they have live betting as well head on over to betonline.net you can use that mobile device you learn about all the trends you learn about all the action bet online where the game starts and this feeds because. into the Ben Simmons question, right? Because at the time of the trade, we said on the po- I said this is as much for Philly. It was about opening up the door even wider for a championship this year, and for Brooklyn, it was about yes, potentially keeping the door open, but really about being able to reform yourself going forward, be younger, have guys that you can have under better control, lower cap number on Ben Simmons, etc. And maybe that's the. Seems contradictory because if that was the case and you were playing for the future, then why not let Kessler over play 25 minutes a game? Who cares outside of the perceptions of it? But do you think that that's a big part of it? And and you can you can address whether or not you think Simmons is actually going to be coming back to play. Depends. They win game three, right? Like if they lose game three, why are you playing a guy in what's probably going to be a sweep? I mean, maybe you can I, injure him and then not have him available next year. But Matt, you got to think big picture. These, this, this team has a theme about what they, what happens to them. I personally believe I, – I think it's surprising they're having him play. It's not very netsy to do. Um, you know, you look at the bubble and you have KD and Kyrie and they just didn't play, um, you know, because they hadn't really had a season up to that point. It's just – it seems unusual for me. Um, so, you know, that's that's for me. I look at, I look at that and I think like – it just seems very surprising that they're having him debut in the middle of a playoff series after not playing all year. It's not, it's not in line with how I guess the team normally functions. Um, so I, I think I'll start there. Uh, I'd love to know who's pushing this and, and mm. where that's coming from. Uh, second off, do I think he's going to be effective? I mean, <laughs> Look, I people have really sexed up the idea of what Ben Simmons is going to look like after a year-long layup. You know, and first off, like, the idea is, like, all right, he's going to come in there and he's going to play the Bruce Brown role. Like, Bruce Brown was really good yesterday. He did a good job against Tatum, uh, rolled well and, and made, you know, smart plays from there. The floater looked pretty good. So, you know. Bruce Brown is playing the Bruce Brown role. Bruce Brown's, do, look, Bruce <laughs> Brown's doing his thing out there. Like, you, that was a, about as good as he's ever defended Jason Tatum. So you have that. Um, and then I look at the other side of the ball. Simmons comes in there. That's another, another non-shooter. And like maybe the most egregious non-shooter that the Nets have right now, because he's not like a, a Bruce Brown with a floater. He's not a Bruce Brown that's going to cut into open space. He's definitely not a floor spacer. Like you can't even get the occasional corner three from him. That's another guy that you now have on offense for, against a Boston defense that all they've done is just shift over on a Kyrie and KD. That's all they've done the entire series. What He's probably guarded by Al Horford. Al Horford's going to just say, great, hang out in the dunker spot, do your thing, uh, build, you know, I don't know, start a campfire there. And like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go over there and try to like double KD. So I'm a little worried, man. And, and, and that's all of this is without mentioning that he has no continuity with the team that he's about to play with. None. He's, he's barely played with them. He just started doing what, four, you know, five on five, four on four a couple days ago with these guys like you know you can only learn so much in film rooms you got to get out there and do it so 
yeah, I'm I'm really pessimistic about it, honestly. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm not even worried. I just have like zero expectations. Yeah. There's no worry about it because I think worry only stems from having an expectation and then wanting to see it fulfilled. I don't know how. Well, he could get hurt too. That's my. That okay. would be the other worry. <laughs> well, then there you go. Then then that's a real worry because ramping it up, ra- ramping. I got ramping up. I hate it. getting yeah, sets of play. Getting sets of play in a playoff game, which is about as high leverage physical basketball as you can play like right out of the gate is like standing literally standing still for a year and then going to a dead sprint. That's exactly how everyone gets hurt. Like wait till you get a little older. Like when you try to do that, you just get hurt. I'm not comparing myself to an athlete, but I'm, this is just, this is long tested. This is why baseball players get hurt all the time. It's not because they're Mm -hmm. doing anything hard. It's because they stand around forever and then they sprint as fast as they possibly can to go do something. And then they get hurt. That's really the only reason. And so this is the, this is the equivalent of that situation you're, and then, you know, if they're down three, nothing, I don't see any point in doing it. And you're putting it in a, against a team that would probably love to not for nothing more than a lot of other teams, except for maybe Philly would love to just bury you in confidence now <laughs> because they know it's going to be a couple more years of this too. Like there's not going to be any easing in of the situation for him. It's mind boggling. It's only makes sense to me because nothing about this net season makes sense. And so if you follow a, a timeline of, hey, none of this has made sense and we've never gotten, there's only been obfuscation around every single piece of this. The timelines have been nothing but 100% wrong. Then you're like, oh, of course he's coming back for game four because that's the only part of it. It's like the only part of it that makes any sense is that nothing has made sense. And, and to, to tag on to what you said too, Matt, it's like, what is the intention around this season? If the Nets still believe that if they can get out of this first round, they can continue to press and the matchups get a little bit better for them. They can manage some things a little better. Drumming can be a little more effective. X, Y, Z. If that's the case, then you get the desperation of trying to bring back in Ben Simmons to survive this matchup. But as Doug said, not only is it going from a standing to a sprint, you're also doing it against a physical team like Boston. It's not like you're doing it against a floor spacing squad that wants to run up and down the court with you and leave some openings. It's going to be one where he's going to get beat up should he be in there. Um, That being the case, last thing is when we come back home here, Doug and I said it on the last episode, are you... Are you out on this on the Brooklyn Nets for this series? Or as we say, listen, they were two tight games. You lost it on the last second buzzer beater. Boston won their home games. Do you think that Brooklyn can come out, win game three on Saturday, and then reset the table and go from there hitting game four? I think they could I think they could win one of maybe both the next two games. Am I am I convinced they're gonna win this series? No. I think that I think there's too much that's happened this year. And you're watching a team right now that just is playing like there's been instability, um, you know, and and just instability at every level in a way. Like it just, like, do I think Steve Nash is going to be there next year? No. Oh, no. you think? Okay, hold on. So then, real quick, because now because this can be twofold here. It can be because it doesn't matter when things aren't going well. The coach is who gets fired. You don't go trading Kevin Durant. Um, but but just on from the X's and O's standpoint, everyone seems to agree. Ime Adoku is is really running circles around Steve Nash. I agree that Steve Nash has not been the perfect coach and that he struggles and the adjustments aren't always there. I've also seen plays like the beginning of game one where things looked really good. And then maybe Kevin Durant decides that he's going to be hard headed and lean into figuring it out. Is there any level of that where Steve Nash maybe has game plans? And we know all teams with superstars are beholden to the idea. If they want to take over a game or be ball dominant, that's going to happen. I would, I would tend to think that there's a level of, Hey, where are the adjustments? Where are the in-game strategy here? But I, I do wonder where where does the responsibility lie if, if Nash is ultimately going to be fired? Would it be just don't, an, don't answer that yet? I'm going to ask. I'm going to attack on one more thing. Yeah, don't answer. Also, that. no, no. Okay, <laughs> I want you to answer, but I'm going to attack on one more because I want you to add this to the end. Do you also think he's not going to be coached because he'll be fired or because he'll walk away himself? Oh, could see either. Could see. Could see either way. Okay, so personally. go back to what Adam was saying, but I just wanted to add like this one. I just wanted to clarify just, your point. He seems downtrodden. Like you look in these pressers and you compare to like how he was even at the start of the year to now, you know, and it's just like, he's just playing the hits at this point, but it's not even like a like fun, like, well, you know, we're kind of a new team. It's just like, I feel like he's just up there with like a gun to his back, like somebody on the PR team being like, answer the question, Steve, say, say the line about the pre say it, say it, say it's training camp right now. Like, it's just, I feel, I feel for him. He's a nice, he's such a nice guy that I think part of me too, like uh, resonates, like uh, he just kind of resonates with me in a way, but um, no, I, I don't know. It just like, it doesn't feel like he has a grip on the team at all. Uh, even Kyrie yesterday had that weird quote about, you know, how Ime has got, you know, a set of defensive and offensive fundamentals. And it was just said in a way where it 
was kind of like it's just sort of sounded like he was looking over it's like you're looking over at the i don't know at the aisle and there's like a cute girl across and you're with whatever you know let's say you're with a date that's not go well that's what it kind of felt like it was that's what it was like. You know I mean? Well, I know we're getting we're getting a little far afield, but then from that standpoint, <laughs> like, wouldn't I mean, who who knows who Kevin Durant's dating on the coaching staff? But from that point, though, wouldn't then last season, wouldn't Kevin Durant have said, "Hey, you know what? Fire Steve Nash. I want Adoku to be the to be the coach here." Like, this is that the one thing about we assume Steve Nash was hired because it was approved by the idea of we're bringing in these players and you like him and you want him to be in position there. There's some weird reverse engineering of, and then if it doesn't work out, even though he's a first time head coach, we're going to look at it as players and go, I mean, what are we talking about here, fellas? We got to do something differently as opposed to having a certain level of expectations around what it means to have a first time head coach. I don't know why they hired a first time head coach. It'll never make sense to me ever. I just, right. I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I know. I know. And I, like, I'm asking, I'm asking for an answer that nobody, ha- that nobody has, but <laughs> if just... anyone would, it be Matt Brooks. Before we get out of here, Matt, we've been doing a fun thing here. We ran a poll. Uh, now you can tell me if you prefer bummer scale or the bum meter, it's your choice, but we, we had done this nice little number here and I'll get it up there for the camera. And as you can see now, now Doug will tell you, I reduced the bum scale a little bit down. I was fully in the bum. At the at the after the second game, because it really I was bummed out, but I, I've reduced the level of being bummed out here. In theory, the game three can go better. If you were going to place yourself on the scale, there you see Doug. He's fully in it. He's having a bad time. I'm, I'm moving toward very bummed. Oh, yeah. very bummed. Okay. There you go. <laughs> where where do you where would you find yourself right now in terms of the state of this playoff series? And maybe just you know this this feels like when you have these players, it's always and the big picture, right? Like where where are you heading into game three? Uh, all right. I was on the phone with uh, my Nets daily teammate and good friend Chris Mulholland last night, and we were we were discussing like what we were thinking of off season content wise. So I there think that's I think okay. that's gonna I that's think that's indication. gonna be it. I'm yeah. So I'm Let me bummed. go ahead. I'll help you out here with the assist. If you're you can put on, that way up there. If you're over on YouTube. That's gonna be <laughs> fully in the bum <laughs> well, for Matt Brooks. He's fully to, in the bum. To, to, I'm to pretty piggy- bummed, man. <laughs> To piggyback so that, juiced. Matt, Adam, and I have had the same exact conversation. Like, as we're doing this, hey, we're coming five days a week, no matter where. If the Nets, if the Nets could retract better or worse, their, they could retract their team, and I think we'd be locked into five episodes a, a, a week for a time. And we've had the conversation too. And if that's a litmus test, which I think it is, with Chris, friend of the podcast, Chris, um, the I better that, friends than you. I think that um, I think that is clear. I think that is it. Kind of tells the whole thing, right? It's like when you start to see what might be the end, like you do have to sort of start preparing yourself for it. And sometimes you got to prepare yourself for content. Sometimes you got to prepare yourself as a fan. It's not, again, it's not being defeatist. It's just sort of being a little realist. Like it's good to begin to introduce the idea so as not to be devastated by it later. Yeah. And I think Nets fans are starting to like understand that might be their fate this year. It, it, It was weird. Even watching this game too. And you watch like the first quarter and, and, you know, the Nets are up by 15 or so. And you're just – I kind of was watching and I was like, I I don't really feel like they're hugely outplaying the Celtics at all in any way. It was just kind of like, you know, they it, 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 Bruce started off well and that kind of gave them a nice start. and But it never really felt like they were putting their stamp on the game in a way. And I just don't think they've been able to put their stamp on the series. And I look at that and I take all that data and it's like, I don't, if they're not able to do that, then I don't know really what you do from here. This might just be a matchup where they don't, they don't have the counters and they never had the time this year to actually build those counters. And that's why you need continuity. You can't just come into a playoff series and say, well, you know, defense, it's not great. Kind of fluctuates. We don't really rebound. Uh, You know, offense comes and goes not don't have great ball movers, but we know we have Kyrie and KD. So We think that's enough. It's like, you know, you can't just live off that. Well, I'll tell you what, very rare when you see supporting cast not feeling like they're defeated yet while your two superstars may be displaying those attributes. That's uh, only only atypical of the Brooklyn Nets season to this point. (laughs) Listen, man, we're going to get out of here. We leave you these parting words of some people can't believe in themselves until someone else believes in them first. That was Robin Williams from Goodwill Hunting. I I don't know what we utilize that for. If it's for us doing the content on our individual (laughs) podcast or for the team at large, the bottom line is, Doug Nori, myself, Adam Armbrecht, and of course, Matt Brooks, who's producing content for Nets Daily. Also, as you're hearing this on his podcast feed, the Clear Out podcast as well, man. Just absolutely awesome stuff. Hopefully, we hopefully they last long enough that we can do this again and talk about the successes and the changes that they made to get themselves back in the series, man. Thanks, as always.